Welcome to Expedition Self on Ohm Times Radio with lifelong learner, entrepreneur, and creator of the worlds of Expedition Self, Sam Parado. Sam shares four decades of studying, guiding, and teaching how to go inside so we can build an incredibly powerful, dynamic, and validating relationship with the self. Expedition Self is laced with stellar, unexpected insights about what it means to be human. Listen now and ignite your self-development process with Sam Parado. Well, good evening. Uh, and those uh, horror shows, good evening. Welcome to my show. I'm Sam Parado, and this is Expedition Self Uh Tonight, I don't know, I was going to talk to you a little bit about coming up with the word expedition self. It was a long time ago, but um, I love it. And so when I get to say it, I always get a little a little tingle of, oh, yes, that's what it is. It's all about uh, taking a journey into the self. So tonight, we'll be talking about how to raise the bar on your relationships. So if you've uh, been listening to my show for any length of time, you know that Going inside is all about the relationship you cultivate with yourself. So tonight is just another attempt on my part to help you think about how to raise the bar on all relationships in your life, and certainly the one you engage in every moment of the day with yourself. Uh, When I uh, think about the idea of being in relationship, and then I talk about it all the time, what I've noticed in my own growth work over, over decades is that I often have to revisit things over and over and over so that um, the places where I kind of return back to my default self, they, 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 you know, they perk up and they go, Ooh, wait a minute. I remember this. All right. Let me like find myself there again. So I think that's one of the reasons I just keep talking about inside self, inside self. And what does that really mean to do? I would love to have you call in tonight. The number is 202-570-7057. Last week, I gave the wrong number. (laughs) So this week, I made sure to write it down again. If you find yourself wanting to share or ask questions or just say hi, uh, I do love it when someone calls in. And if you listened in last week, you heard my interview with wonderful Wanda, who was gracious and courageous and shared some of the more vulnerable aspects of her personal growth journey. So if you would like to share yours with me here on air, well, you can write me and let me know at hello, hello, it's me at expeditionself.com. And I guarantee, I guarantee you'll receive a return email from me personally, not from my team, but from me. So, all right. And the other thing is I've changed the format. So instead of starting out with a bunch of kind of random growth thoughts now, I actually dive right into the topic and figure if we have time at the end, then I'll do some random growth thoughts at that time. So, okay, let us dive in. First, I want to talk about why we would even have a desire to raise the bar. And and it's because I think we're complacent. You know, most of us try to get along, right? They, we try to get along in relationship. And the very idea of raising the bar suggests that we'd have to proactively do something. And when we do that, well, some risk might be associated because it's, it's not how it is now. <laughs> I don't think we can say enough about how much we default to the familiar. So when we think of the raising of the bar, it's oftentimes based more on something being wrong. Like we want to change something because it's an issue or a problem that we've decided needs to be fixed. So this then implies that if I try to raise the bar, I'm going to suggest, especially if I'm going to raise the bar with a person rather than a a thing uh, or a part of life, I'm, I'm going to be suggesting that there's something wrong with how we're relating which that in and of itself may now disrupt what that I have, what I have working for me. So the question, which is why do it unless there's a problem? Well, here's the answer. Raising the bar is about raising the bar. What more juice can you squeeze out of the being in relationship? And how can you spread the juicy goodness that a relationship can generate as far as it will go, 
And of course, when I mean juicy goodness, I mean the challenging things and the things that make you feel joyful and delighted. And if there is more satisfaction to be gained, well, why not raise the bar and grab a hold of all that isn't currently within your grasp? See, raising the bar in relationship, it means that we're going to turn rocks over rather than walk upon them. And with that, it means that we're going to ask someone else to turn those rocks over with us. <laughs> but, but before we get to that, the how to do that, I, I want to back way up and talk about the very state, the very state of being in relationship. Have you noticed that I don't say being in a relationship? Have you noticed as you've listened? Well, there's a reason for this. And it's because I want you to focus on some tangible object in your site right now. I'm going to kind of give you a, a little experience to help make my point. All right. So focus on this tangible object in your site right? Wherever you're sitting, whatever you're doing while you're listening to me, maybe it's the tree in the front yard or the refrigerator in the kitchen, or uh, perhaps it's your foot stretched out on the ottoman in front of you. Now, as you focus on this object, I want you to notice how you relate to it. Okay. All right, here we go. I'm going to have a whole lot of things to think about. Ready? Here we go. Start with the distance. How far away from you is it? How much of a stretch is it for you to touch it? How is it shaped? What's the weight of it? The dimensions of it? What does it feel like to include it in your awareness where you can actually see it in your mind's eye? Now think about what this object means to you. How important is it? How often do you notice it? Have you noticed it? What do you have to do to take care of it, to keep it maintained and working and showing up? And this is a big one. What kinds of memories does it hold for you? Now stay with me. <clears throat> it's interesting. If you feel yourself kind of floating away, this is really one of the elements of consciousness is that staying with really what is the relationship is pretty hard. All right, some more questions. What value do you place on this object or this thing that you're looking at? What needs does it fill for you? How do you treat it? How do you interact with it? Do you take it for granted? Again, what value do you place on it? What importance? And then why does it belong or not in your space? And if it wasn't there, what would it feel like to you? And would you notice it? And lastly, what do you emotionally feel about it? And if you were to stretch your awareness to include it as if it was part of your whole life, your whole self, if you became one with it, what would you notice about how it functions in your life, supporting you or creating difficulty for you? So this is what it means to be in relationship with something. It's all that. It's the answer. All that answer of those questions means that you are in relationship with something and you're attending to it. You can put any topic you like in the blank line. Food, money, sunshine, flowers, your health, a person, a chore, a habit, a pillowcase. I mean, <laughs> anything. You can answer these questions about anything. And what I'm really saying is, you are in relationship with every single aspect of life, both the things that are tangible and the things that are intangible, the things that are conscious, the things that are unconscious, the people that move around you, the traffic, the weather, the job, everything, right? You are in relationship with it. Now, I'm going to go to the next piece of this. 
I want you to fill in the blank with six aspects of you. And I'm I'm actually going to provide them for you this time, even though you are completely u- unique. I think these are kind of universal aspects that we all have within us. All right. Now, you can certainly come back to this and put your own aspects in if you'd like. OK, ready? Here we go. First one is your inner child somewhere between the age of five and 12. The aspect, this is the second one, the aspect of you who is often giving to others but forgets to act on your own behalf or listen to your own needs. The third one is your productive achiever, right? Get things done, make things happen. The next one is your creative self. The next one is the emotion you feel least comfortable with. The emotion or way of being you feel least comfortable with inside of you. And the last one is the self-serving you, the selfish you, the part of you that takes care of you that will survive. Okay, I'm going to give them to you again. Your inner child somewhere between the age of 5 and 12, the aspect of you that's often given giving to others but forgets to act on your own behalf or your own needs, your productive achiever doer, your creative self, the emotion or way of being you feel like least comfortable with, and the last one is the self-serving or selfish you. Now, I'd like you to choose one. I know there's a lot of exercise going on here, but I promise we'll it'll get us where we're trying to go today. So choose one of those six, okay, of them in this moment. And I'm going to go through the questions now that I provided you with above about being in relationship. Okay, so in this area, what we're working on just right now is how to be in relationship with you. Okay, so choose one and let these questions float through your mind about relationship with one of those six aspects of you. Okay, so start with the distance. Now, this distance is now interpreted through the lens of emotional or psychic distance or comfort, emotional comfort and ease. How far away do you stay from it? How much do you know about it? How much of a stretch is it for you to touch it, to listen to it, to respond to it? And how, how is it shaped? What kind of form does it take inside of your psyche? What does it feel like to include it in your awareness of, of valuing of it? All right, here's another one. Now, these are some new questions. How dominating is it? How much space does it take? How much do you like or dislike it? Okay, now think about what this aspect of you actually means to you. How important is it? How often do you notice it? What do you have to do to take care of it? What kinds of memories does it hold for you? How do you respond to it? And then what value do you place on it? What needs does it fill for you? How do you treat it? How do you interact with it? How often do you listen or check in or care about what this aspect is saying or feeling? Do you take it for granted? Do you just expect it to be there and you don't even think a second thought? Again, what value do you place on it? I got a little, we're going to go a little further. Why does it belong or not in your space? And if it wasn't there, what would it feel like to you? And would you even notice it? How much do you claim it? And lastly, what do you emotionally feel about it? And if you were to stretch your awareness to include it as if it was part of your whole life, your whole self, if you became one with it, what would you notice about how it functions in your life, supporting you, or on the other hand, creating difficulty for you? So this is what it means to be in relationship with the self. Of course, you know, we're only talking about six aspects of self. And you're if you're engaged in growth work like me, you're looking for aspects of the self all the time, right? Dimensions, extra dimensions, extra subtleties. So I just want to like help make sure that you're not excluding things as we talk about being in relationship. If you 
happen to be into archetypes, well, you'll see those as aspects of the self. You could apply the same questions. If you're into internal family systems, you'll see yourself through your original family members. If you're into astrology, you'll see yourself through the characteristics of the zodiac and the planets. Or if you're into the Enneagram, you can see yourself through the nine types. And if you're into shamanism or paganism, you'll see yourself through nature, animals, and the seasons. I just want to really emphasize that looking into the many aspects of the self is the only way, the only way to come into relationship with the self because the self isn't just one thing. You are a compilation, a conglomeration, a homogenization of all that you are. And, and so we, we want to keep re-emphasizing that you don't just default to the singular dominant aspect of you, because that is not the same as being in relationship with the self. I'm always trying to redefine it and redefine it so that your psyche keeps remembering to include more. And all those questions that I gave, which you can re-listen to, right, are really great triggers for you to sit down. They actually work as a worksheet. And you can actually pose those questions every time you want to think about raising the bar in relationship. Okay, we'll continue with this very fascinating conversation when we come back from break. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com. <laughs> My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. If I could be you... And you could be me for just one hour. If you could find a way to get inside each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. All right. Well, we are back. I'm Sam Parado. You're listening to Expedition Self. And today we're talking about how to raise the bar in relationship. And it dawned on me when I was on break that I haven't described the snail of life in a while. So yeah. So so let, let me just tell you about the snail of life. It's basically, I want you to picture a big snail, right? And I want you to picture the way the the home, the shell on his back, how it's like got this spiral that goes along with it. And picture uh, that life for you started, right, when there was just a little dot before, before it started rolling itself together. And so the idea of the snail of life is basically this idea that every second of every minute of every hour of every day, of every week of every month of every year, that you have embodied you, your psyche has collected experiences and interpretations and and attempted to process that, of which about 93% of those are unconscious and stored awaiting your attention. So when we talk about raising the bar in relationship, what we're talking about is starting to engage more often, more deeply, and more fully with all of those dormant snail of life experiences, right? Stored pieces of self-information so that you are able to name it, own it, 
and put it into action in your life, meaning the expression of you. Because every time you dig around in there into that snail shell and you find more of the self to be in relationship to, with, with, relationship with, right? Um, Every time you do that, you are now going into life with more mass and substance of who you are. Now, we can circle around to raising the bar in relationship because now we can say that this means right? Because what we're, what we're talking about, we're redefining it. We can say this means we want access to what's, to more of what's available from the other, as well as we want to bring more of what's available in us and then see what gets created from that. Okay. We want access to more of what's available from the other. That's the idea of in relationship because there's us and then we're in relationship with something. So picture this cool, swirly lava lamp. We're not raising the bar because there's something wrong with what we already have. We're raising the bar because there's more to have. I'm going to say that again. We're not raising the bar because there's something wrong with what we already have, even if we might have some dissatisfaction about it. No, we're raising the bar because there's more to have, more to be. But there's a catch. And the catch is that for most of us, and this is, this is kind of tricky to describe, but for most of us, we do feel some aspect, some element of inadequacy. We do think there are things about us that are problems or issues or weaknesses. We, we do feel like we're not enough. So although I'm going to say it over and over, we don't raise the bar because there's something wrong. Usually hidden in the back of the room, there's an aspect of us hiding around the corner that's definitely coming from fix me or fix this. I did a show on the whole fix it merry-go-round a while back and really way at the beginning. If you're interested in the whole show about that, it's there. So anyway, so we have to keep looking for the place where we want more, where we desire more, where we see life is offering us this great inner adventure of self-discovery because that fix-it aspect of self is, a, is actually a smaller part of what we're really about, right? Our charge is to get larger than it, to, to access really the whole of what we're all about as beings. And, and that smaller part, that fix-it smaller part, it was born out of a whole bunch of life experiences that if we do our growth work, if we really engage we work with that snail of life, and we're going to heal and notice and transform it. And it's going to become something that becomes part of our substance and our mass. So <laughs> if we're not raising the bar to fix something that's wrong, that is a problem, well, then why are we doing it? Hmm. What do you think? What do you think? Well, I'll give you my response. <laughs> we would be doing it because that's why we're here. We're here for that. That's why we're here, right? We're here to experience the range, the, the, all those aspects and planes and dimensions and angles, right, of being human. The raising of the bar is the state of being in motion in a growth mode. We're not doing it to acquire or achieve, although I think that that does come with it. It brings it to, to us, but to become from within. So when we raise the bar in relationship, we are creating a space where more of us has to show up, right? When we say, I'm going to raise the bar, well, what goes with that is, oh, that means more of me is going to have to show up. And when that happens, we're thrown into that not knowing, the being unconcluded that I talk about all the time about how to do this or how to respond, right? We don't know what we're, we're it's new territory or it brings up feelings we're not even sure about or that we're not worked through, right? And then this produces discomfort, right? Because because we want to be a little uncomfortable, we want to feel that dynamic tension. We want to feel the idea of things not fitting together. And then what happens? We grow. And then we grow. 
<laughs> so the other catch about raising the bar is that we don't we don't want to disrupt what's harmonious, you know, what's going along okay, what's kind of working. I think you probably could say that it's the complacent part of us, but I feel like that kind of diminishes the true human experience in that because in truth, it's it serves us to have harmony and it supports us in feeling like wherever we are, that there's a sense that things are working or moving together. Um, but because we don't want to disrupt what's har harmonious, it, it undermines us from uh, like A, seeing that we want to create more and then B, going for it if we do see it. I, I really, I can't say enough about this. I hope you are connecting to the places in your life where you want things to stay harmonious, the relationships you don't want to disrupt, right? Do you have any idea how many relationships I have been in some connection with where the people didn't want to create more. And then at some later date, sometime in the future, because they didn't welcome the chance to raise the bar when it was there and it was possible, now there is a problem. Does that make sense? That what often happens is the way of being, of putting harmonious band-aids uh, on our life when we're supposed to be uh, unearthing these deeper aspects of the self, because that's what's empowering for us, that what happens oftentimes is that the thing that we're, we could deal with without it feeling like a problem, it would just be part of the growth, turns out to be a problem, right? Like, uh, I love the money one, right? That little issue about money with your partner is now a huge issue and brings about a ton of distress because it feels like it's a problem now. Right. So there is an element of understanding all these things within ourself that block us from being with what's so that block us from really opening up and allowing what's on the inside of the self, all those answers to those questions to actually find their way uh, into our our exchanges. Right. You see, the raising of the bar is also preventative. It, it helps to create. Uh, a set of habits and pathways in relationship with you and others that is laid in advance of it being needed. I often notice that when uh, someone hasn't done any growth work and they haven't really opened up to themselves in life, and then they run into a health issue or they run into something that really shakes them up in life, some event that happens or some occurrence. And now they don't have the pathways to actually welcome all of the processing that's a result of some event that is in fact overwhelming, right? So this is, a, I really want to say this, it's like raising the bar helps you handle life. It helps you be prepared. Is this making sense? When you go for raising the bar in relationship with yourself and others, you create, you create a more solid, strong and dependable channel for working through all of the differences, all the misalignments, all the unexpected events, all the stuff that throws us off in life that are a result of bringing any two things together that are a result of how life actually goes, which is we don't control everything. There's plenty of stuff that goes down that's unpredictable. And true, sometimes things integrate easily. Sometimes it's easy for you to work with some change. Sometimes it doesn't actually shake you up. But sometimes they don't work very well together. And when you raise the bar before things are problems, well, now you have practiced because we know we have to practice with all this stuff. It doesn't, you don't just snap your fingers and you all of a sudden know how to be with yourself and know how to listen without judging and know how to actually recognize when you're being self protective. No, it doesn't work like that. So when you raise the bar before things are problems, well, then you have a way to think and listen and learn how to sit with differences without being under stress, without being reactive, without being self-protective and defended. 
you know, you're able to embrace discomfort without having to be in denial about it. So this raising the bar means that you're digging things up intentionally, knowing they may be disruptive or uncomfortable at a time when they're not hot or charged. And the things you're digging up show themselves when you invite the answer to all of those questions and then begin to deal with them. Now, when I say all of those questions, it was all, all of the prompts to help you describe or define what it means to be in relationship. That's, that's what I'm talking about. You want to think about being in relationship, you put in the blank, whatever it is you're working on being in relationship with, whether it's in yourself or with the world or with others, and you put it in the blank and you ask all those questions. It's a great tool. Okay, so and here I had a little fun here when I was thinking about this. Uh, put a porcupine and a bunny together. Uh, okay, put a lion and a fish together. Put a giraffe and a spider together. Okay, how about a couple of others? A five-story house with no staircase. Are you, are you with me, what we're doing here? A rainy day with no umbrella. A rainy day with a raincoat. Did you ever stop to think about the very idea that being in relationship by its very essence means bringing unmatching things together and then being willing to feel it? So if you remember those aspects of you I mentioned earlier, your inner child somewhere between the age of five and 12, the aspect of you that's <laughs> giving and forgets to have your own needs, the productive achiever doer, your creative self, the emotion or way of being you feel less comfortable with or the self selfish, self-serving you. I don't think most of the time when I have had them meet up and connect, they don't go together. They don't interrelate. These aspects of you don't always like what the other one is doing. But without talking, without being in conversation, there's no way for understanding to come from it. So much of our lives is uh, in, <laughs> I want to say in conjunct, <laughs> right? It, it's dis, it's in disarray. It doesn't quite just slide in together. And so this is such an important point about being in relationship. If you are the lion and you're trying to figure out why the fish can't breathe out of water without talking to the fish, you're not creating a new channel for relationship. In fact, you're likely creating a down the road issue because both you and the fish never understood why it went the way it did, why you just stood there while the fish was gasping for air. I know that is an outrageous example, uh, but I kind of wanted to do that so that you could just really get your head into this idea, right? Is that really we are all these different aspects and we relate to different aspects differently, right? But without talking, about those differences, where are we? Where are we? So the first step when you are raising the bar in relationship is to examine and get truthful and get honest about the nature, the tone, the feel, the description of your relationship you're exploring using those questions. The next thing to raising the bar is talking talking. Can you believe I just put that out? Talking, talking, raise the bar through talking. You want to raise the bar in relationship? The key is talking. I can hear in my head right now. But what if the other people don't like to talk? What if I don't like to talk? I've never been a talker. I've always been quiet. Okay, well, that's where you start. You cannot raise the bar in relationship if you're not going to talk. You cannot raise the bar in relationship if you're not going to facilitate talking. You can't raise the bar in relationship if you're not going to figure out how to be inside of spaces where windows open and doors open that allow for you and others to walk through through talking. Okay, so this brings me to the steps involved in raising the bar using talking as the medium. So one is you need a new commitment to share vulnerably what's hidden from you and beneath the surface. 
that new commitment, whether you're talking about with yourself, right, or whether you're talking about with an issue, like around how you've dealt with time or money or uh, your physical routine or with others, right? The vulnerability is I am not going to listen through the same ears. I'm not going to twist and turn and uh, define and describe and make things mean the same things that I've always done. I'm going to relate as if it's new. I'm going to take off the old perceptions that are already in place and I'm going to come to it with a new commitment to be vulnerable in what I receive and what I share. Now, I think I've been describing where this information comes from. It comes from being more in relationship with yourself, right? And then sharing with the other person about being in relationship with them. Now, in this case, I'm going to be bouncing around. So I now put another person in it. But in this example, right, you're actually trying to promote talking within the self. You're trying to promote an exchange of how the object or the life theme is responding to you or in relationship with someone else. You know something is vulnerable when you feel at risk sharing it. You, you feel something inside yourself. You pay close attention to what's coming out. It's, kind, it's the kind of thing that only counts if you're invested in expressing it for yourself, not using it to get the other person to share their, theirs. That vulnerability thing, we just can't practice enough. Okay, when we come back, we're going to talk about creating new agreements. Okay. The best of holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. You came across someone struggling with hunger. How would you recognize them? Would you notice an eight-year-old girl who's, who's not, not excited, excited for, for summer, summer break because she may not be having lunch again until September? Or a war veteran who's, who's having, having a hard, hard time, time landing, landing a job and getting back on his feet? I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. I, I am, am hunger, hunger in, in America. America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. All right, I'm back. Sam Parado, you're listening to Expedition Self. We're talking about how to raise the bar on relationships. And before break, I said the next thing we want to do is create new agreements about why and how we're going to share. So I don't know any relationship that doesn't have a set of agreements that have already been explicitly or covertly at play within it. These uh, agreements, they form the scaffolding of how you talk and what you talk about, what you don't talk about, why you're together, what matters to you, the habits you use to get along in the relationship. So if you're going to raise the bar, you need to look closely at these agreements and figure out which ones don't serve your mission. So here's some examples. We don't talk about our past. You never talk seriously over dinner or during the week or when our kids are home or on Sundays. We only talk about our relationship when something's not working. Otherwise, we focus on getting along. 
We don't bring up failures or events that made us ever feel bad. People, you know, things that are, people are sensitive about. We don't talk about money. We only talk about how happy we are once a year. <laughs> so you can tell I'm not focusing on raising the bar in relationship with another person and not someone necessarily who is a romantic partner. It could be a partner, a parent, a child, a friend, a sister. Every relationship in our life has agreements attached to it. When there's no person on the other side, there's still that thing. So if you wanted to raise the bar on your relationship with money or time, you would start by looking at your agreements around time you spend, attention you pay, help you receive, the habits at play, how you treat it. I, I hope... I hope I'm helping you understand that you're in relationship with you, with others, and with everything in life. You are one with all of it, whether you you realize it or not. So if you want to raise the bar on any of those relationships, I think that's the 50th time I've said raise the bar. It begins with the idea of understanding how you are in relationship with that thing and then talking about it and then looking at the agreements wrapped around that thing, you or the other person. So what's an agreement? It's a series of discussions that ask each person to share what they feel comfortable with and what they're wanting. And these discussions lead to a uh, a working out or compromising or plotting a new way of relating. So a lot of times, it's about taking something that's comfortable in the relationship and making it uncomfortable with intention. You're pre-talking through this to open up choice and redirect the will, my will, your will, so that it can now be in support of raising the bar. The beginning of family meetings requires an agreement. We can be in relationship with a group too. So here's the thing, this agreement to get to it may take a while because it requires patience and no judgment and open listening. And a lot of times when people talk to me about changing agreements, they speak about it from a very intolerant place. Like I tried to change our agreement about not talking about the past and they wouldn't even talk. So here's the thing. The other person or group or thing is used to an old agreement. Just because you've gotten to a place where you want a new agreement doesn't mean they would have ever even gotten there. So becoming impatient has you not be really responsible for the bar raising because being responsible means you own that you set the agreement up to begin with, right? And it means that you maintained it in the way that it was. So to expect someone to just hop on board, is not the way it goes, nor should it, because you actually have to do the work. You have to do the labor of figuring out how to do it. So when you're creating a new agreement, you have to be willing to share vulnerably and to talk about where you've come from. And most importantly, you have to be able to keep bringing the conversation back to it's not broken. This is about building, creating, constructing, not about fixing problems and bad things. I often will hear it when I'm trying to create agreements, but I thought we were fine. And to that, I'll say, well, we are fine. But I think there's more we can have. And when I get there, I try to start talking about the quality of life, right? Because it's these quality of life issues like aliveness and love and security and connectivity and joy and understanding and substance, right? When we raise the bar, we're actually trying to improve the quality of life at a being level. So in the conversations about raising the bar, well, we want to tap into the quality of life that means most to us. Of course we do. And we want to listen for the quality of life that means most to the group or to the other person. When we think about changing agreements with inanimate aspects of life. The key is to zero in on how our quality of life would shift if we related differently. My favorite one here is time or money or my body or food. We're creating a new agreement with ourselves to make way for a new level of valuing it. 
it's the same thing. And I hope I hope this is coming through as I talk today. Person or thing or group or aspect of life or habit, you're going to run through the same steps if you're going to raise the bar. So this brings me to the next key in conversation. Sometimes this is interwoven with the forming of new agreements, and it has to do with discussions about how to create safety. So we've already said that raising the bar means you're disrupting what's already comfortable and at play. So it makes sense, doesn't it, that you'd have to discuss directly how to get safe in this new level of conversation. So I want to give you some examples of requests I've run across in my growth work. I can talk about everything but this. Well, sometimes there are really big things that everyone knows are too big. And so this can be a totally reasonable request to help smooth the way and make it comfortable to start talking. Here's another one. When I talk, you always have opinions about it and argue with me and tell me I shouldn't feel the way I do. <laughs> oh boy, this is a big one because the whole point of talking is to be able to push back and generate new ways to see things. So in order to get to an agreement when this is in the space, you're going to have to look at how much you're trying to change that other person so you can give more room and space to just talk in a neutral way, right? The key to this agreement is to offer a yes. I'll do my best to just listen, but I'd, I'd like to be able to ask questions so that I can understand better what's going on for you, right? You have to kind of sort it out inside yourself, like how can I meet this person in the middle with their need for safety and my need to talk? The thing you need to realize in forming agreements is that they are changeable. So if you can get the space safe enough, then you can get to an agreement that says, we're going to question and try to understand how your feelings are connected to your life story and mine, or we're, going, we're agreeing to explore the core factors that shaped us into who we are. Okay, here's another one. Another good one is, I don't want what I share to be thrown back in my face at random moments. I don't want my vulnerability used against me. Okay, this is such a common one. I don't know that there's any person that hasn't ever felt this. I know we're all guilty of doing it because once we have information, we like to explain why things are going the way they are and our brains just start accessing all that good fodder. <laughs> so it's also important to note that for many of us, we have a sense of what's under the surface for ourselves and for others. So when it finally gets said, it's like, yay, now it's out in the open so I can refer to it. No, not true. This requires another agreement that it's available for natural dialogue, that it doesn't feel vulnerable now, and that there's ease in discussing it. Okay, I've got another example. If I hit a spot and I'm not comfortable, we agree to leave it for that moment and then return to it. Or another one, I don't want to talk in front of people or when I'm feeling stressed from my job. Right. The idea is you're engaging and collaborating to create a new agreement that opens the space up to raise the bar through talking. So lastly, I want to really emphasize that you have history with the thing or person you're trying to create a new agreement with. And you may have to talk about this history and own up to how you've handled it before. Yeah, when we talk about this, this usually happens but I'm committing to doing something different this time. You may have to help draw out how it's gone, right? This is when I will return to earlier days and mention, remember we used to do this or it used to be easy or it was hard when we talked about this, but then when we worked through it, it wasn't, right? You want to bring a frame of reference that helps the other person to tap into what's possible in this new safe agreement. The bottom line about raising the bar is you're the one facilitating it. You cannot expect the other person or thing or group to just be in the same headspace you are. And if you're the one facilitating it, well, then you are the one who's going to make it yours. For the entire history leading up to this moment, you cannot put it on them. You can't say things like, every time I tried to talk about this, you did it. Right? It would now sound like I wasn't able to create a place for us to talk about this before, or I wasn't in a place yet 
And so I'm recommitting to a new way to do it. By the way, we have to do this with ourselves. We have to recommit. I'm going to be safe for you to not be perfect inside myself. My inner child, I am not going to give you a hard time for those feelings that you've had. I'm not going to judge them, right? We have to recommit. How's it sounding? <laughs> so we have the understanding and assessing the nature of being in relationship using my little checklist up that I did earlier. We have the talking as the medium. We have the creating of new agreements. And we have the establishing guidelines for safe space. And the next one has to do with continuity. If you're going to raise the bar, then you have to look at the frequency with which you can pay attention. If you're bringing attention to it for 15 minutes out of a week, and the other however many minutes are spent not paying attention, it's likely your bar is not going to get raised so much. In fact, it might even work in reverse, right? Because you state you're committed, but then don't actually bring yourself to it. So what I'm saying is the amount of time you stay aware and conscious and invested will have a direct relationship to the progress. And this doesn't mean that anyone can stay committed 100% of the time, right? It's, it's, it's actually about being committed enough to stay close, then fall back, then you notice you fell back and then get close again, right? It's the way meditation is, right? You just watch your mind wander without getting overly attached to it, but then you come back to your breath, come back to your practice when you notice it. And I, I see this the same way. You're going to wander. You're supposed to wander. And the more you notice you wandered and notice what happened when you wandered <laughs> and inquire about what was happening that was at play in the wandering, you're doing your own growth work. And so now we get to the place where we can see that raising the bar in relationship is another way to get more invested in growth work. When you get new agreements in place, it helps to draw you back and into the depths of you. It helps you bring a level of grace and attention and appreciation for your own growth process. So finally, I just want to spend a moment on all of the possibility of your life, of you being you. This idea that you can be more for yourself and as a result... That creates a life filled with love, connection, constructability, and creativity. We don't just get it by living and droning on and existing and surviving. Sure, you'll achieve things and eat and work and participate in families and groups. But what comes with that droning if you aren't wanting to find the more of you is that people get upset and take themselves out. Events happen and you can't figure out why you lost out. Disappointments occur and they don't get worked through. The, the hard stuff of life is harder. We suffer more. So this raising the bar is preventative in that you get to tap more fully into what's possible for you and you actually see the power of your actions at work that you can cause it. And this makes it not just an idea, but an actual sense of your own capability to cause real and palpable movement within relationship in your life. There is not one conversation I've been in with the thousands I've held when someone wasn't talking about the feelings around being in relationship in some way and how that was affecting their lives. Not one time because it's where the heart opens or closes. It's where the chances and opportunities appear or disappear. It's where our futures take shape and hold our deepest dreams and hopes, or where our tomorrows look bleak. All right, well, I hope in this hour you have felt inspired to raise the bar being in relationship first with yourself, then with all that exists in life, and with others. Have a wonderful week, and thank you for being with me.